Greetings and welcome to another lecture in introductory psychology. This one involves sexual orientation, which is quite a large topic these days. A lot of people are talking about, uh, for instance, gay marriage and that sort of thing. So this is going to be a short overview on what we understand of the origins of sexual orientation. Now, I do want to point out that sexual orientation is more than who a person wants to have sex with. That tends to get kind of lost in the shuffle. I suspect because people uh, tend to think about what is most vivid and someone having sex is much more vivid, for instance, than someone simply being attracted or having a crush on or being in love with. Because all of those are included in sexual orientation. It is not simply who one wishes to have sex with or does have sex with. By the way, both are valid. Virgins can have sexual orientations because they may be attracted to somebody, even though they're not, they're not acting on it. And this is where it gets really kind of complicated because, of course, human beings, being human beings, we very rarely fall into nice, discrete categories. And I'll talk about more th of that in a second when I introduce you to the nice, discrete categories we keep trying to put people into. The first is heterosexual, probably the largest, although it can be difficult to tell. Um, Heterosexuals are those that are attracted either predominantly or entirely to the opposite sex, depending on how you want to define it. And quite frankly, if you want to define it as they are only attracted to the opposite sex and have had no attraction of whatsoever to the same sex over the period of their adult lives, then this number is going to be a lot smaller than you think. Homosexuals, on the other hand, are attracted to the same sex physically, romantically, sexually, you name it. Again, usually we use predominantly because it is possible for someone to have had one or two opposite sex experience, for instances, and still be homosexual. Perhaps they were having sex with someone of the opposite sex to see if they liked it, to see if it would work. A lot of times uh, gays and lesbians are told, well, how would you know if you didn't like sex with someone of the opposite sex if you haven't tried it? So they may try it or they may want to fit in. By the way, there also seems to be an awful lot of heterosexuals trying same-sex sexual behavior in order to satisfy curiosity, see what it's like, whatever the reason. So people sort of cross the border going both ways, as it were. Speaking of, bisexuals are attracted to members of both sexes. Now, I would like to take a moment to dispel some rumors about bisexuals. You don't have to be a perfect 50-50 split to be bisexual any more than you have to do absolutely everything with your left hand to be left-handed or to be ambidextrous, do everything equally well with both hands. Okay? It is indeed possible, for instance, to be sexually attracted to both sexes, but only romantically attracted to one. You're still bisexual. You could be almost, you know, mostly attracted to one sex and only kind of attracted to the other, you could still call yourself bisexual, although some people call themselves according to whichever sex they are mostly attracted. This is why it gets complicated, okay? Because when you start trying to figure out where to put the dividing line, where are we going to put the cutoff? So are we going to just let people call themselves whatever they want to? For instance, there are also a lot of men out there, men in particular, who call themselves straight, even though they may be having sex with other men, but they say, well, I'm straight because I'm playing the male role. And so therefore, since I'm uh, b being the man in this particular encounter, then I'm not gay. And it gets very complicated. It gets very complicated when we're trying to put people into categories. There's actually a fourth category that you probably haven't heard of, and I suspect it's because, quite simply, people in this category don't tend to piss anyone else off. Asexuals are not attracted to anybody. This is pretty much a permanent condition. This is not somebody who simply doesn't have a boyfriend or a girlfriend right now, for instance. This isn't simply someone who is between relationships or who has just been dumped and therefore is sort of saying that they're not going to be attracted to anyone ever. This is someone who literally isn't attracted to anyone ever. They're not sexually attracted. Now, they may have sex. They may masturbate or they may have sex with other individuals uh, simply sort of to keep the relationship going and such, but they have no real need or desire to have this. And these are not necessarily people who are hormonally imbalanced either. It simply seems that when we're talking about sexual orientation, we have people that run the entire gamut. 
By the way, whenever we start talking about these particular numbers, individuals are always saying, okay, well, how many people, it's usually phrased as how many people are non-heterosexual. Heterosexuality is assumed to be the default. Although, if you look at some cultures, it may not be quite so accurate. There have been cultures, for instance, where it's been expected for a young man to more or less be partnered by an older man and taught the ropes, as it were, before that younger man is then expected to marry a woman and then perhaps find other young men when he becomes older to all... I mean, it, it, it's complicated. <laughs> so... It, it, it's very difficult to come up with them. But the other reason it's difficult to come up with numbers is quite simple. Because even still in our culture, particularly in certain parts of our country, being homosexual is a very, very bad thing. It can lose you your job. It can lose you your family. Your children can be taken away from you. Sometimes it can lose you your life. And so people have a lot of incentive to lie. And I'm sure they do. So even... In the best of times, it can be difficult to determine just how many people fall in each of these categories. Now, one of the first studies looking into this was done by Alfred Kinsey, who was a sex researcher in the late 40s, early 50s. He came up with the number of people he, he found to be non-heterosexual to be roughly 10%. 10% of the population. This is the number that is still being used, by the way, by a lot of people. Um... It was argued that some of Kinsey's methods may not have been particularly uh, error-free and that perhaps his sample was not representative of the population as a whole. But it is interesting how at least one more recent study has found similar numbers. There was a study published in uh, 1993 called the Janus Report that found that roughly 9% of males and 5% of females self-identified as homosexual or lesbian, gay or lesbian. Um, that's smaller than Kinsey, mind you, although when you, if you take those numbers and average them together, we're probably talking between 7 and 8% of the population, which is pretty darn close. But the Janus Report also found something else very interesting that has also been found in other studies. They found that a lot of people did not identify as gay or lesbian or bisexual for that matter, and yet had had same-sex sexual experience since puberty. We're not going to count playing doctor when you were four. They found, in fact, roughly 17% of females and 22% of males had had some kind of same-sex sexual experience since puberty. But remember, only 9% of males and 5%. So we're talking about 12 to 13% of people identify as heterosexual and yet have had same-sex sexual experience. Like I said, there is a lot of border crossing. <laughs> People do not want to stay very nicely in their neat little categories. The other interesting thing is that the more open the culture appears to be about homosexuality, the fewer people seem to be put into that category. There was a study done in 2011 by a, uh, a, a gay lesbian advocacy group of some kind and they did a pretty good study and they found that only about 1.7 percent of people identified as homosexual either gay or lesbian and about 1.8 percent identified as bisexual so when you put that together that's 3.5 percent of the population but they also found that a whole lot of people had had same-sex sexual experience but basically said that they were heterosexual it's part of that whole problem I was talking about. How do you want to measure this? Do you want to go by self-identification? Then you're going to run into people's behaviors not matching up with their labels. Do you want to label people according to their behaviors? Then you're going to piss people off because they might say, well, I may occasionally have sex with someone of the same sex, but I'm not bisexual. I'm heterosexual. Or I may occasionally have sex with someone of the, same, of the opposite sex, but I'm still gay or I'm still... Le it's complicated. And people haven't quite figured out a way to come up with a, 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 a finding to, to figure out exactly what the percentage is. What is very interesting that I read recently is when the general public is asked about the percentage of people in the population who are gay or lesbian, the numbers tend to be about 25%, which is much higher than any of these surveys have ever found. So the general public seems to be overestimating the number of gays and lesbians. And it does kind of make you wonder whether the current brouhaha about gay marriage would be a lot quieter if the public realized that there's not a lot of people that are going to be taking advantage of this. 
because there's not really a huge number of people who are gay and lesbian. And bisexuals may or may not marry someone of the same sex. They may marry someone of the opposite sex. You could still be bisexual and be in a relationship with someone of the opposite sex as long as you're still attracted. Look but don't touch kind of things. Or maybe with open marriages, look and touch. But that's a whole other kettle of fish that I don't want to get into. The other thing that, get, that gets asked after how many people fall into these categories is why are some people gay? Why are some people straight? Why are some people bisexual? And the answer to that is we're still not entirely sure, but we know what it isn't. It appears to be something that occurs very, very early in a person's life. It isn't something that people just suddenly uh, decide when they hit puberty. It may be something that they realize when they hit puberty. But an awfully large number of gays and lesbians say that they always knew that they were attracted to someone of the same sex. They always had crushes on people of the same sex, but it didn't really become a big deal until puberty when the hormones kicked in and they really decided, you know, they knew what they wanted to do about it sort of thing. Um, but it does appear to be something perhaps biological going on. But now, biological doesn't necessarily mean genetic. An environment doesn't necessarily mean the environment after birth, for instance. There's very little evidence, for instance, that having gay parents means the children, particularly adopted children, will grow up to be gay. Okay, it, or having a gay parent, or having a gay teacher. There doesn't even seem to be very effective evidence that being sexually molested can cause someone to be gay, whether or not they're sexually molested by some of the same or opposite sex. The, the, the information is really complicated. Not to mention the fact that that's further complicated by the idea that sexual predators may be able, for instance, to spot boys who get crushes on boys or girls that cr get crushes on girls and decide to take advantage of that. They pick the child because of that. It's so difficult to tell. Okay. But it may indeed be something that goes on. Probably we're talking development before birth. Sometime during prenatal development. There are some interesting findings, mostly having to do with, with male homosexuals. For instance, there's a finding that if a woman is pregnant with a male embryo or fetus and is under a whole lot of stress, then that son is going to be slightly more likely to be homosexual than a child of someone who isn't stressed. There's also evidence that the more older brothers that a man has, the more likely he is to be homosexual. Why? We don't know. And it doesn't appear to be environment. It's, it's really complicated. But the one thing that we know that it isn't is a conscious choice. Who you are attracted to, who you want to have sex with, is not a conscious choice. You can always consciously choose whether or not to act on those attractions. And a lot of people who go into the various ex-gay programs that, by the way, psychology washed its hands of a good 40 years ago, um, but there are still these programs out there, the vast majority of them tend to come out, people tend to come out, and it's not that they are now all of a sudden straight, it's simply that they are no longer acting on their attractions. That's not changing your sexual orientation. That's changing your behavior. There doesn't seem to be a really good way to change sexual orientation, to change the underlying urges. They tried everything. Trust me. Everything from drugs to shock therapy, you name it, it was tried to try to change gays into straights, and it simply didn't work. So do remember that, like I said, it's not, we don't know what it is. We're not sure exactly what causes it, but whatever causes it almost certainly has some sort of biological cause or origin. And it happens long before we ever have those first sexual urges. And it is not something that we can choose or something that we can change.